Hello and welcome to Jamhammer. In this video, we're going to take a look at the basics of how to play Warhammer 40,000 9th edition. I'll be covering all the essential items you'll need for a game, then how to set up a table, and finally going through each of the seven phases that make up a battle round from movement to morale. There are time codes in the description, so you can jump straight to a particular phase of the game if you wanted to refresh your memory. There's also a link to a PayPal wallet there, so if you enjoy this video and you want to help support the channel, you can click on that. All donations will be very welcome and we'll be put to creating more content like this. Let's start with a quick intro then. Warhammer 40,000, or 40k, is a very popular miniature war game produced by Games Workshop. It's been around since its first appearance back in 1987 with Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader. This early release was heavily influenced by the second edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battle, and it was much more inclined towards role-playing rather than wargaming. The second edition was released in 1993 and started to lean more heavily towards the grim dark elements and large-scale tabletop battles that we have come to associate the franchise with. There have been several different versions of the game since then, and we now find ourselves with the 9th edition, released in 2020. The game typically pits two players against each other, they face off using armies of miniatures, and try to achieve objectives in order to score points to win the game. We'll cover how the game mechanics work in more detail as we go on, but for now, let's get straight into it with all the necessities for playing 40k. So, you're going to need dice. A lot of dice. On the plus side, you only need one kind of die with the current edition, the standard six-sided die, or D6. All of the rolling in this game takes place using these. You may also find it useful to get these in a few different colours. That way, you can use one colour per player and have an extra one or two for other purposes, such as differentiating between special weapons. When you're not rolling dice, you're going to be measuring distances to see how far units can move, shoot, etc. So, a tape measure is a very useful tool. Most missions revolve around objectives, so you may find it useful to get some markers to keep track of these on the tabletop as well. Scrap pieces of paper can do in a pinch, but something a bit more hard-wearing like these cardboard tokens don't cost too much. Another optional but useful tool is a dice tray like this one, so that you can minimise dice flying over your floor and let people know that you're down with hobbits. Once you've got everything assembled and someone to play with, you're going to decide on a mission. Missions will often have information on how to set up the table, as well as what win conditions need to be met. These can be found in the 40k rulebook, plus any number are also in campaign books, box sets and mission packs. There's a really simple mission, only war, included with some freely available rules for how to play 40k that we'll be using as an example in this video. I'll leave a link to where you can download these rules from in the description below, as these cover most of the basics that we're exploring in this video, and in a range of different languages too. Turning to that example mission then, and we can see that the first thing we need to do is muster armies. If you wanted to see how all the following plays out in an actual game of 40k, I'll put in a link here and in the description to an introductory video that I made for the channel recently. This is a battle report of the Only War mission and it goes steadily through all the steps of setting up and playing 40k. We can see in this chart the various sizes of battles and how long they take. You can see that it says something about combined power levels in the middle there. We use power level, or points, in 40k to balance our armies and ensure that no one side has an unfair advantage over the other. A combat patrol game is the smallest force we can field and it constitutes 50 power level, or around 1000 points, and will take an hour to play a game of this size. Each unit of miniatures in 40k is a certain power level, or costs so many points. Power level was introduced recently and provides a quick way of balancing your army. However, for accuracy, I, and I think most other players, always opt for points, as this breaks down the specifics like how much individual unit and weapon option costs. 
you can find this cost on the datasheet for your forces. These are usually found in books known as codexes, which contain all the information you need for your army choice. The free rules provide an example datasheet, and we can see in the corner here that a unit of 5 assault intercessors with a sergeant costs 5 power, which would be around 95 points. Underneath we can see a unit of 3 outriders has a power level of 6. To make this task easier, there's a really useful tool that will calculate and track your army roster for you called Battlescribe that I'll also leave a link to in the description. This is a powerful application that is constantly updated with the latest 40k data, and it can be installed on your phone or computer for free. There's a lot of pertinent information on these datasheets too. They tell you everything about your units, and we'll break this down now with these examples from the free rules. M is movement, and the number in inches is how far your units can move on the battlefield. WS is weapon skill, and the number shows what they need to roll on a d6 in order to hit the enemy in close combat. Next is Ballistic Skill, abbreviated to BS, and that's the same as before, but for ranged weapons. So, our Assault Intercessors need a 3, 4, 5 or 6 on a roll to hit with their pistols and grenades. S is their Strength in close combat, and T, Toughness, is how resilient they are to harm. We'll refer back to these in the shooting of fight phases later. W is wounds, so how much damage they can take before they are slain. A is attacks, how many times they can attack with their chainswords in the fight phase. LD is their leadership, which will be tested in the morale phase to see if our units flee the battle or hold their nerve. Finally, SV is their armor save, so what they need to roll to prevent taking damage when they've taken a wound. Ok, we've mustered our armies. I've opted for the Adeptus Astartes, who will be fighting against their fallen brothers, the Heretic Astartes, for this video. To that end, we have a tactical squad here of 4 Space Marines armed with bolt guns, and a veteran sergeant who has a plasma pistol and a chainsword. Leading this army is a librarian who has an ornate force sword, but also a range of psychic powers at their disposal. The Heretic Astartes are bringing a squad of 9 cultists armed with auto guns, plus one with a heavy stubber, and a champion armed with a vicious close combat weapon and a shotgun. Leading these is a sorcerer who has a four sword as well as a plasma pistol and their own depraved psychic abilities granted by the Chaos Gods. Next is the mission briefing. This lays out what we need to do to earn victory points, or VP, and the player who scores the most over five rounds wins. We have two ways of scoring VP here. Our primary objective is to capture and control objectives that will be set up on the table. These are captured by a unit standing within 3 inches of the token. We'll see this in action once the game is underway. We can also score a VP for Slay the Warlord, which is nice and simple. Kill the enemy warlord. For our example armies, the warlords are the librarian and the sorcerer. In full games of 40k, we have the option to select three secondary objectives to try and turn the tide in our favour. Generic ones like Slay the Warlord can be found in the rulebook, but your codex will also detail faction specific ways that you can score VP2. We have an army, we have a mission, now all we need is a battlefield. You can really dedicate as much time and effort to creating a table for your hobby as you do to collecting your armies and doing so can really add an extra element to your games. At the most basic level though, any area that's large enough for our forces will suffice. A table, a desk, or even just a bit of clear space on your floor can work for wargaming. Turning to the rules again, we can see the size needed for different battles, with 44 by 30 inches being large enough for combat patrol or incursion sized armies. Remember that these are 50 to 100 power level, or 500 to 1000 points, so certainly enough space for our first forays into 40k. I'm using a kitchen table that folds out for my game, and then I'm rolling out a battle map for some added immersion. These can be purchased from third party retailers, like this PVC one that I'm using, which came from Wayland Games, and I'm really pleased with it. It's quite thick, with a nice print, and rolls up for easy storage, 
and can then just be unfurled to convert an area for gaming if, like me, you don't have enough space for a dedicated table. The downside being that it curls up at the edges, so if you do get one of these, I'd recommend getting some white tack just to hold down the edge like this, and you'll be all set. Games Workshop does have a line of modular cardboard battlegrounds too, but these can be quite expensive to make a large enough space for gaming. This battlefield is looking a bit flat though, so we'll add some terrain next. The rules mention that we should deploy one piece per 12 inch square, so for a 44 by 30 inch table, that's around 6 large pieces of terrain dotted around, but these are just general guidelines. Some scatter terrain like these crates and barrels can be put around too for some added flavour. And these boulders are just bits of stone I found on the ground and cleaned up for the purpose. Again, Games Workshop sells terrain for use in their games, and they're great quality, but expensive. These Munitorum armoured containers, for example, cost more than all the other terrain combined. MDF terrain like this is a fraction of the price and can still work very nicely for your games. But use whatever you can afford or have to hand. All of my games of 40k when I was a kid were played on a carpet battleground with my units fighting amidst stacks of books and stationery. The free rules unfortunately don't provide any rules for terrain, but they are in the main rulebook. Basically, large pieces like these block line of sight. General idea is that if you can't draw a straight line between your shooting unit's head and their intended target, then they can't see them to shoot them. Standing inside terrain like this provides light cover too, so the unit gets a plus one to their armor save. Don't worry, we'll go over targeting and armor in the shooting phase. Also, there's some flexibility around terrain and rules anyway, so you and your opponent can just decide between you what properties the pieces have. It's your game after all. Okay, we have a battlefield ready to go, and now we need to set up those objectives mentioned in the mission. Missions tend to tell you where to deploy these with a handy map to illustrate their placement. This example mission though has us alternating where to place these with some guidance. So we roll off, the highest number wins, and we take it in turns popping these down, ensuring that they're 6 inches from a table edge and 9 inches from each other. Our Adeptus Nostartes rolls the white dice and gets a 1. Not good. Then the Heretic Astartes player rolls the orange dice and gets a 3, so they deploy a marker first. We check to make sure that it's 6 inches from a table edge. Great. Then the Adeptus Astartes player places their marker and ensures it's 6 inches from an edge and 9 inches from that first marker. And so on until all four are placed. With the objectives placed, we can now get our armies onto the table too. In general, we deploy along the short edge of the table with a dedicated zone that's so many inches from said edge. If you look at the mission map here, we can see that our deployment zones end 12 inches from that central point. It can help to measure these and then pop something on the table, like these white dice, as a reminder where we can deploy our forces. We roll off again to see who gets to pick their table edge. Adeptus Astartes gets a 4, but Heretic Astartes get a 5. The highest number wins, and they get to pick their table edge. However, to balance this, the loser of the roll gets to deploy first. We then take it in turns to alternate, setting up one unit each. Adeptus Astartes gets to deploy first, and they place their tactical squad behind that die that I've put there to represent the edge of their deployment zone. They deploy behind some light cover, and even manage to sit on top of an objective, which will score them 1 VP in their first turn. But they're already making some nice tactical decisions. You can see that they're all together as a group. In fact, they're all within two inches of each other. This is known as unit coherency. All models that are part of a group must stay together. If a unit has up to five models, they must stay within two inches of one other model. Remember that our tactical squad is a unit of five models, so they have to abide by this rule. If there were six or more models in their unit, then they must be within two inches of at least two other models in their unit. We'll see this play out as Heretic Astartes are deploying a unit now on their chosen table edge and they're putting their cultists inside this ruin near one of the objectives. Back to Astartes and they put their warlord, the librarian, behind the tactical squad. Now this is another wise choice 
as this will help to prevent their character being shot at due to a rule called Lookout Sir. This means that their character cannot be targeted as they are shielded by a unit of three or more other models. The Heretic Astartes heed this rule and deploy their sorcerer behind another unit too. Here's where the fun really begins. With both forces deployed, we now have one final roll off to see who goes first. Adeptus Astartes roll a 4 again, but it's really not their day as the Heretic Astartes get 6 and will be taking the first turn. 40k has 5 battle rounds, and each battle round consists of 7 phases that are worked through sequentially. These are the Command Phase, Movement Phase, Psychic Phase, Shooting Phase, Charge Phase, Fight Phase, and the Morale Phase. Each player goes through the 7 phases in their turn, then the other player goes through all 7, then that battle round is finished, and then we move on to the next. Once 5 battle rounds have been completed, we tally up to VP, and the player with the most wins. We'll go through each of these phases now. I'll point out here that we're going with the basic mechanics of 40k gameplay, so we're not including any of the army specific bonuses in the examples like Hidden in Plain Sight or Shock Assault. The command phase is when a battle forged army gains a command point, abbreviated to a CP. The basic rules don't include info on what this means, but essentially it's a way of organising your army. Your forces must all belong to the same faction, which can be found in the keywords on your unit's datasheets. Essentially, they need to be from the same army. Our Heretic Startes are all, well, Heretic Startes, so they're all from the same faction, and we're one step closer to being Battleforged. Next, the army must have certain units to qualify. For our combat patrols here, we need one HQ choice and one troops choice. Again, we can find out which units qualify for this in our datasheets. That triangular icon in the top right corner shows that the Assault Intercessors are a troops choice. So both of our armies have a HQ and troops choice. Our Heretic Astartes have a Sorcerer that's HQ and a Cultist Squad which is troops. Great, we're battleforged. We get 3 CP base for a combat patrol sized game. We've established that we're battleforged, so we get an extra CP going up to 4 in our first command phase. CP can be used on generic abilities found in the core rulebook for things like re-rolling failed dice rolls, but again there are numerous four specific ones that you can find in your army codex. The command phase is also typically when a player would accrue victory points for capturing objectives. So our Heretic Astartes don't score a point, but when it's the Adeptus Astartes turn they'll gain a VP here for deploying on that objective marker. Being battleforged and command points are some of the most difficult to understand part of the game for me, as none of this was around when I used to play the game back in 3rd edition. I swear it gets much simpler from here. Again, check out that introductory game of 40k in the link below if you want to see an example of all this playing out in an easy to follow format. Onto the movement phase now, and this gives us the opportunity to get our armies up the board and start bringing the pain to our enemies. Our cultists have a M or move range of 6 inches so they can move this far. The unit moves together to stay in coherency. Then our sorcerer also has a move range of 6 so they move up behind them. During this phase our units can also opt to advance. Our units can move and advance in a round, however if they do they'll be unable to shoot their guns or charge into combat in the subsequent phases so choose wisely. To do this, we'll roll a d6 for each unit we want to advance, and the result is how much further they can move this round. Our cultists get a 4, so they move an additional 4 inches, going 10 in total. Our sorcerer decides to advance too, so roll a d6, and they get a 6. We measure this out, but that group of cultists is in the way. We cannot move through the bases of other models, so our sorcerer can't go the full 6 inches they rolled here and instead they're going to have to move 4 of these inches. We can always move up to our range, so we don't have to move the full distances. Our units can also elect not to move and are said to have remained stationary. Also worth noting is that we cannot move within 1 inch of an enemy model. 
This one inch range is known as engagement range and is the range at which we will be engaged in close combat. We can charge into combat as we'll see later in the charge phase. However, we can make a special move out of engagement range called falling back. Here our cultists are in engagement range of the tactical squad. They want to move out of this so make a fall back move. This is the same as their M range so they can move up to 6 inches away from the tactical squad. However, doing this move means they cannot shoot their weapons or use any psychic powers. They can still charge though if they want back into the melee. Onto the psychic phase and here we can use psychers to conjure up the powers of the warp. Only certain units have this ability and it just so happens that our Adeptus Astartes Librarian has these skills. All psychers know the smite psychic power and the Librarian decides to manifest it now against the closest enemy unit, the Cultists. To do this they need to pass a psychic test on 2d6. The result needs to match or exceed the psychic powers warp charge. Smite has a warp charge of 5 and they roll an 8 so it's successful. Uh oh, who's that looming in the distance? It's the Sorcerer, another Psyker who has the ability to null the spell's effects. This is called Deny the Witch. If a psychic user is within 24 inches of the caster they can attempt to deny the spell but will need to roll 2d6 as well and exceed the caster's roll. They're well within range so they're now going to need a 9 or above. Close, they get an 8 which matches it but doesn't exceed it so Smite is successfully cast. The spell description states that it does d3 mortal wounds. To calculate this roll a regular dice and half the results rounding up. They roll a 3 so that's 2 mortal wounds against the cultist squad. Mortal wounds don't allow any saving throw against them and unlike regular damage any excess damage is applied to other models in the unit. More on this in the shooting phase but two cultists have their heads melted and are removed from play. One final caveat of psychic abilities though, if you roll a double 1 or a double 6 when rolling a psychic test to cast a spell then the caster suffers something called perils of the warp. The power not only fails but the caster also suffers d3 mortal wounds. Even worse if this is enough to kill them then they explode, they are removed from play and all units within 6 inches, even friendly ones like the tactical squad also take d3 wounds. So our librarian is vaporized with that double six. We roll a d3, get a three, and that's two wounds, enough to kill Marine. The cultists were within range too, so we roll another d3, but it's just a one, so only one of them is slain too. Onto the shooting phase now, and this is where we get to unload guns in each other's faces. There are several different types of weapon that act in different ways. We have heavy guns like this stubber which suffers a minus one to the hit roll if the unit moved. So these cultists have a ballistic skill of four plus meaning that if they moved the heavy stubber unit could only hit on a roll of five or six. Assault weapons like this shotgun can be fired even if the unit advanced but a minus one to hit again. Rapid fire weapons such as the tactical marines bolter can fire double the number of shots if the target was within half range. Pistols like this plasma one are the only ranged weapon that can be shot within that one inch engagement range but can't be shot alongside other weapons. So turning back to the example data sheet and the rules these outriders have heavy pistols but cannot shoot them and their twin bolt rifles in the same round. Also notice the number after the weapon in type. This shows how many shots that weapon gets, so one for the pistols and two for the twin bolt rifles. And finally some units have grenades listed. Only one model can use a grenade when it shoots though, so this outriders unit can't toss three grenades at the enemy. In order to shoot their weapons a unit must be in range and be able to draw line of sight to at least one part of one model in the enemy unit. The target cannot be within engagement range of one of our units or they will be considered locked in combat. 
You can also split fire if you so choose, and fire different weapons at different targets. All shots from a weapon must go into the same target though, so you can't split fire if you get more than one shot from a gun. For example, occultists want to shoot. They can see the tactical squad and the librarian is not behind three or more models, so no lookout sir rules here and they're also a viable target. The cultists split fire and target the marines with their assault rifles, while all of the shots from the heavy stubber and shotgun are going to go into the librarian. The cultists have a ballistic scale of 4 up, so they need 4s and above to hit. Starting with the heavy stubber, and they only get one hit. Next, they need to roll to see if the shot that hit can wound their targets. The weapon has a strength, S, of 4, and the librarian has a toughness, T, of 4. If the S is the same as the T, then they're going to need another 4 or above. We can see on this handy chart that if the S is lower, we need a 5 plus. If it's half or less, then a 6 up is needed. Since he's the same, we need a 4 plus to wound. It's another 6, so now the librarian gets an opportunity to make an armour save. They have an SV save of 3 plus, so they need a 3 or above to negate the damage. They get a 3, so just about deflect the shot and do not take a W wound. The shotgun fires next, but getting a 3 and a 2, it misses. The cultists measure for range now. They have a 24 inch range with their guns, and are actually within 12 inches of the marines. Their guns are rapid fire, so they get double the number of shots. There's 8 guns, so that's 16 shots in total. After some disastrous aiming though, they're only humans after all, they only manage 3 hits. These guns have a strength of 3, and the marines have a toughness of 4, so we need to see 5s or 6s to wound here and they do get two wounds. The marines have a SV save of 3+, plus, so they roll that now. And fail. The guns do one damage each, which is enough to slay marine. It's worth noting here that although the marines have two wounds each, you can't allocate the two wounds to two marines and not lose anyone. So the damage has to go on to the wounded model. We go to the next Heretic Astartes unit now, the Sorcerer, and they want to shoot with their pistol. We measure, and they're out of range, so they cannot shoot this round, and we go on to the next phase. We're into the charge phase now, and the Adeptus Astartes want to get into some close combat action. In order to charge, a unit has to be within 12 inches of their target. The Marines are 7 inches away, and the Librarian is 8 inches. We then have to roll 2d6 to see how far our units charge. Tactical Squad first, and they get a 7 just about making it within that 1 inch engagement range and successfully getting into combat with the cultists. Our librarian next, and we get a 9, so they comfortably make it into combat too. If you don't match or exceed the distance necessary, then the charge fails, and your unit doesn't move at all. Another feature of the charge phase is heroic interventions. This is where a unit with the character keyword in the opposing player's army check your data sheets for this, can join into a combat that's within 3 inches of them. The sorcerer is a character, the librarian has charged into that 3 inch range, so they declare a heroic intervention and join the fray. Once all the units you want to charge have done so, we move on to the fight phase. This is one of the few times that gameplay alternates, with the opposing player electing a fight first, and then alternating back to the player whose turn it is, and so on, until all fights are resolved. However, any units that charge to get to fight first, so our Adeptus Astartes player gets to attack first. The first step is to pile in. This means that the unit you are fighting with gets to move up to 3 inches towards the nearest enemy. A model can contribute to a fight so long as it's within half an inch of an enemy model or a friendly model that is itself within half an inch of an enemy model. So our marines pile in, and all of them can now attack the cultists. The veteran sergeant has a special melee weapon, a chainsword, and swings with this first. He has two A, or two attacks, plus an extra one for wielding this weapon. He has a WS weapon skill of three up, so two of these hit. 
He has Strength 4 against Toughness 3, so needing 3 up again here. Both of these wound. Now the Cultists have a save of 6+. However, a Chainsword is AP-1. This means it is Armor Piercing, and the number after it shows what you reduce the Armor Save dice roll by. Since the Cultists have a terrible 6+, Armor Save, minus 1 from that would make it a 7+, Armor Save, which is impossible on a D6 meaning that they lose their armor save altogether and are just outright slain. The only time that AP does not apply is to any of your units that say they have an invulnerable save. Now the rest of the tactical marines attack with their combat knives. Three of them hit, they roll to wound, only one wound, but the cultists do get a chance to save as there's no AP to worry about here. But they fail, and another is killed. The Adeptus Astartes player has another unit that charged, so they resolve the Librarian's attacks now. Three swings with their Force Sword go into the Cultists. The Librarian is Strength 4, and their powerful blade grants them plus one strength. But that's not quite double the Cultists' toughness of three, so the Librarian still requires a three plus to wound. Just the one. The sword also has an AP of minus 3, so there's no way that Cultist is getting a save and they're removed from play. The Heretic Astartes player gets to activate their units now. They pile the Cultists in towards their combats. Now they're in combat with the Tactical Marines and the Librarian, so they move in towards both of them. The Sorcerer only intervened in the combat with the Librarian, so they pile in towards them. The remaining cultists get 7 attacks between them. They could split these between their two targets, but they opt for the marines. They have a weapon skill of 4 up, so 5 of these actually hit. Now strength 3 against toughness 4 means 5 plus to wound, and not a single one goes through. They activate the sorcerer now, who attacks the librarian with their force sword. They get 3 attacks, and have a weapon skill of 3 up, so all hit. They have strength 4, plus 1 extra strength from their weapon, means they need 3s or above, and they get 2 wounds. The sword also has an AP of minus 3, so the librarian's SV of 3 up is reduced to a 6. They fail these rolls, and the sword deals damage. Now this particular weapon has a D, damage, of D3, so we roll 2 D3 to see how much damage goes through. Two threes mean four damage, and that's enough to kill the Librarian. We move now to the final phase, the Morale phase. Every unit on each player's side that lost a model must now test their nerve to see if they flee the battle or hold firm. The Tactical Marines are fine, as none of that unit was lost. The cultists, however, lost four of their number. We need to take a morale test for them. That's done by rolling 1d6 and adding the number of lost units to the result. If the overall total is more than the unit's highest LD, leadership, then another model runs and is lost from play. Plus, this triggers a further combat attrition test that needs to be taken for the remaining models. A roll of one at this stage, though, is an automatic pass regardless of losses. Let's go through this step by step. We roll the d6 and get a 5. Plus the 4 who ran is a result of 9. The leadership of the cultist's champion is a mere 6, so they failed. A model panics at the losses around them, runs, and is removed from play. We now roll a combat attrition test, one d6 each for the remaining 5 models. Any rolls of one this time cause another model to panic and be removed from the table. There's a single one, so another model is taken. With four units remaining in this squad, this now puts the unit below half strength. This means that if another combat attrition test is taken, then rolls of one and two will now cause a model to flee the battlefield. We have one final check left to do, and that's to ensure that after all those losses, everyone is still in unit coherency. If any model is not within the 2 inches necessary for this, then they are also removed from play. 
With that seventh and final phase being over, you would switch to the other player and they will go through the seven phases too. Once both players have gone through each seven phases, that battle round is over. The starting player then takes their next turn, and so on. After five battle rounds, the game is over. Tally up each player's VP, and the one with the highest score wins. Thank you so much for watching this video, I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider liking it, subscribing to the channel, and clicking the bell to be notified of new videos being released. And that's a brief intro to the basics of 40k. There's a lot to take in here, but once you've played or watched a game or two, you'll find that it flows smoothly between the phases, and smaller battles like these are very quick to play. There's also way more to this game than we covered in this video. We were just running through all the necessary mechanics for 40k, but there's loads of extra rules for your factions, plus flying units, monsters, vehicles including transports, and crusades just to name a few. Hopefully you found this useful though, and do check out that introductory game alongside this to see everything playing out in practice. And you can learn from the many mistakes I made during that battle. There'll be more videos about Warhammer 40k being released soon, so please do keep an eye out for more content coming soon to Jamhammer. In the meantime, there are plenty of other videos available on the channel, including a few that are on screen now for you to click on. Thanks again for watching.